Thank you very much, everybody, for joining us uh, for this, the February 2023 meeting of the Metropolitan Study Group of the SRIA. And today we are very fortunate to have um, Fred Scott, who will be presenting, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> including musical excerpts, excerpts and imagery. Uh, on Ferruccio Busoni's Dr. Faust, Aspects of the Archaic and Esoteric. So it gives me great pleasure to hand over to your good self, uh, Fred. Thank you very much. Um, it's uh, really exciting to be with you and thank you so much for the uh, invitation uh, to present uh, today. Um, just a little bit about my background. I studied music at the Royal Academy of Music um, in London. Um, First studied piano and composition, and um, that was where I got my basic uh, music education, if you like. Um, unfortunately, around uh, just before I finished my studies, um, I contracted a rare and nasty form of uh, bone cancer. Um, and I, I'm proud to say I'm a cancer survivor of, um, it's coming up for about 36 years now. So uh, every day, since the age of 23 for me has been a, a borrowed day. So I've tried to fit in a lot of activity <laughs> in that time. Um, uh, I'm, I have a family, I have three children. Um, we live in London um, and I'm currently uh, working as a professional musician. I'm also pursuing a PhD at City University. And um, the the overall topic is uh, Ferruccio Bazzoni's opera, Dr. Faust. and um, I'm trying to condense uh, a lot of material into just a few minutes. And I think what's really exciting for me is the uh, question and answer session where I tend to learn um, a lot more than you think uh, from the kind of the questions and the feedback and the input that I'll receive, uh, hopefully from, from the group. Uh, I certainly don't count myself any kind of authority on the topic. Um, particularly since uh, one of uh, my esteemed colleagues is joining us from the, the Boston in the USA. Um, that's Erin Knitt. I hope you don't mind me um, saying this, Erin, but she's a fabulous uh, scholar of Busoni. has many publications out. Uh, there's, there's a new one coming out very soon, which I've uh, pre-ordered. I can't wait to get my hands on that. And I've been very inspired by her work. Um, we were able to collaborate um, recently by writing chapters for a book um, which is edited by a British Busoni scholar, uh, Professor Paul Fleet up at Newcastle University. And uh, we both had uh, chapters uh, in that book, which is a very exciting thing. And I was able to play the piano examples uh, for um, Erin's uh, chapter, uh, which was uh, about the music of uh, Busoni. So I wanted to really try and build in um, two presentations into one, uh, if that's not too um, uh, difficult to do. But I wanted to begin uh, by explaining why I've had a particular uh, fascination, uh, you could say obsession, with this particular piece of music and what it has led to. Um, I am 61 years old, 61 and a half, and um, I first came in contact with this work uh, I was sitting in the piano room of my uh, esteemed, um, unfortunately now departed uh, piano teacher, Florence Crichton, um, who taught me from the age of 14 onwards, uh, got me into the Royal Academy of Music after I'd played for about three years. I started very late so at the age of 14. And I never forget the day I was looking across from the piano to her immense record collection. And I saw the spine um, of a particular album, which I've actually got. She gave this to me. And uh, let me just find this. Th this was the view that I got from where I was sitting. So you can see this sort of Gothic script. I couldn't figure out what it said. I said, that's very interesting. Can I have a look at that, please? And she said, of course you can. And it turned out that it was um, this rather, this is very blurry, I'm sorry, but it's the LP set of um, one of the first recordings of the opera with Dietrich Fischer-Diskau 
in the lead role. Um, she played me the first few minutes of it, and I'm going to do that for you now in, a, in another version because I was captivated and haunted by the opening of the opera about which I knew nothing. And I want to give you just a little example of the sound world uh, that Busoni was evoking. Remember, this is 1924. Don't worry, there's no sound yet until we get to the, the orchestra. I'm very sorry, I'm going to have to uh, cut that short there. I hope you were able to hear that. Um, eerily prescient in uh, many ways of um, uh, the opening of Stanley Kubrick's film 2001 <laughs> and then the use of uh, an atmospheric um, sound world. Um, I was captivated then at the age of 14 and have been captivated ever since. I'm going to divide this um, presentation into two broad sections. I want to explain why uh, the opera, well, why I think it's important and its particular role in, in history and what it was uh, synthesizing and um, the, the syncretism, which as you will know, um, implies a, a combination, a recombination, a juxtaposition of belief systems. And um, I think it's, it's fair to say that the subject matter, uh, anytime the word Faust is invoked. We know we're in for, in no particular order, um, God, devil, demons, bargains, blood pacts, uh, magic, um, symbolism, uh, heaven and hell, all these kind of things. And you'll know that Faust has been a particular fascination in the Western uh, mind really since the 1500s. Um, and pretty much the, the idea of the uh, magician character who is trying in, in, in many ways to usurp the position of deity from a human perspective is going to be called Faustian. Uh, indeed, uh, the philosopher Oswald Spengler in the 20s was evoking the idea of Faustian man to describe the Western mind in all its striving. 
So uh, why was Busoni wanting to produce uh, an opera on Dr. Faust? I mean, surely you couldn't say anything more after Goethe. Surely there was uh, Christopher Marlowe, uh, Goethe, some uh, incarnations in, in the musical literature, um, Elio's Liszt, Schumann, others um, in the Romantic era. What's left to say after Goethe? I mean, Faust Part Two, Faust is taken off to heaven, um, guided by the eternal feminine. Surely there's nothing more to say. Well, my argument would be very much that there's a lot more to say, particularly around this period of the early 20th century. Um, so let's let's go through this. Um, James Joyce made a very interesting comment. He he features uh, somewhat in my um, current research um, because of um, um, Finnegan's Wake and um, the, the implication there that if you put enough symbols in your work, uh, the sheer fascination with trying to unpick everything will guarantee the work's immortality. Um, there's a sense of that in Busoni's opera, as, as I'll explain a bit later on, he did uh, encrypt a lot of information in there. Um, of course, popular fiction has kind of uh, taken this idea on and produced, uh, dare I say it, uh, works of variable uh, value, uh, provenance and longevity, which may or may not stand the test of uh, analysis over subsequent periods of time. But enough of that, I'm not a literary critic. Um, I think there are four ways that we can read the structure of Busoni's opera. Uh, sometimes we'll go and hear uh, a piece of music, and unless unless we're sort of a, a specialist, or, or people will think that, well, well, you specialists, you've got all these crazy ideas. I just want to go and hear it and see what it's all about. And I think that's fair enough. If, if you can't approach a piece of art from the point of view of does it does it speak to me, um, you shouldn't really need to be super highly qualified to appreciate a painting, a piece of music, a stage play, an opera. If it doesn't have appeal, it's kind of um, losing before it's, it's even got going. But I think it's important in Busoni's case with the opera that there are many ways of interpreting uh, what is essentially a very old story. And I explore each of these in my research uh, just very briefly the very standard operatic model. I'm going to talk a little more about this idea of uh, chiasmus, uh, which is the idea of a, a crossing over, uh, a balance point, a tipping point, an inversion point, which I think is very germane to any discussion of um, Dr. Faust. Uh, Judith Crispin, um, a, a Busoni scholar uh, in Australia, wrote a wonderful uh, work really about the, the ritualistic uh, aspects of the opera, uh, with a lot of reference to um, the venerable Australian composer Larry Sitsky, who um, is uh, thankfully still with us. He's just about to release an enormous volume of work entitled The Complete Busoni. And if anyone is qualified, um, not only by his seniority, but also by the fact that Sitsky was personally instructed uh, in, in piano and composition by Egon Petri. Uh, now, who's Egon Petri? He was Busoni's principal disciple. Uh, after his death, uh, we really relied quite heavily on Egon Petri for the continuation of that pianistic tradition and many ideas to do with um, not just the opera, but Busoni's other works and their promulgation. Uh, the, the, this, uh, this five model idea um, is where I'm able to map the structure of the opera uh, onto, onto previous Renaissance models, not only Marlowe, but Shakespeare, in particular the last five, as they're known, comedies. Um, I think that is a bit disrespectful to the idea of what they are. Basically, Shakespeare's engagement with mysticism, um, but I'll be writing more about that. Um, in a, a, a fabulous book by Christopher Booker, who some of you will remember was a, a, a previous editor of uh, the satirical British magazine, Private Eye, um, Booker wrote um, a volume called The Seven Basic Plots, where he, where he relates uh, in, in world literature th this idea that there are 
are five stages in particular to do with with drama and tragedy and certainly um, this is a, a five stage plan that uh, the life of Faust certainly adheres to. Um, there's also um, Elizabeth Butler was a, was a scholar of mysticism and Faust in particular and she relates the story of Faust beyond the 1500s uh, uh, back probably to uh, Simon Magus in the Book of Acts and probably even before that um, we, we have uh, the, the Magi obviously who make their appearance in the Gospel, the men from the East, uh, we have Egyptian musicians, uh, magicians, uh, slip of the tongue, at the time of Moses, um, prohibitions against magic all throughout the Mosaic law and um, the wonderful episode where Saul consults the witch of Endor to summon the ghost of Samuel. Um, maybe things even go back to the, the garden itself, who knows, but I'll be researching that. Um, syncretism is a feature of Busoni's opera, but Busoni was incredibly well read. Um, erudite, esoteric, uh, I was able to obtain uh, from Professor uh, Paul Fleet uh, the library catalogue which was auctioning off Busoni's library after his death. And so you get a fabulous idea of what was in his library. Um, famously, I think 40 plus editions of um, Cervantes' Don Quixote, among other things. He was a, a devotee of uh, Quixote in a very big way. There's a lot of Shakespeare there. There's a lot of poetry, a lot of architecture, a lot of books on mysticism. Um, I, think, I think it would be fair to say that Busoni certainly had an acquaintance with um with the freemasonry although there's no evidence that i've been able to find that he was ever in any way associated unlike for example um franz liszt well the haydn mozart etc beethoven's teacher neef um franz liszt uh sibelius um a lot of masonic musicians out there but i'm i'm pretty sure Busoni would have researched it uh who knows if he was ever particularly involved but there's an argument uh, that I would make that he certainly had as deeper than usual knowledge. So a, a great uh, critic uh, that I've been reading quite a lot of, I think he's pretty much forgotten now, unfortunately, is Wilson Knight, um, who in his book, Principles of Shakespeare in Production, talks about how great drama has got to be, have a ceremonial aspect. And, and certainly Busoni believed this. Uh, he said of uh, music performance that it should evoke the atmosphere of something very serious like a Freemason's ceremony. Now that, that's his explicit wording. Um, and I think certainly he had the idea that, um, that drama has many, many layers. Indeed, we find in the middle of uh, Busoni's opera, uh, Dr. Faust, we have this um, uh, remarkable scene after this um, uh, turning point, the chiasmus, which I'll talk about a bit later, where we find Busoni essentially in a pub or a, whatever they had in Wittenberg in those days, a beer keller, whatever. Um, I like to think of it as a, a place where uh, there, there was a large collection of students who were debating. Um, this is exactly analogous to a later work by the German author Thomas Mann, who uh, wrote a novel, Dr. Faustus, which I'm sure you're familiar with as well. Um, my research focuses on these two works as being particularly important in, um, in the early part of the early to mid part of the 20th century. Um, and I've, I'm writing extensively about that right now. So I don't want to go too much into that while I'm still uh, forming those ideas. But there is a, there's a wonderful example in Mann's novel where the protagonist, uh, Adrian Leverkuhn, who is a composer. Uh, in Busoni's opera, Dr. Faust is an alchemist um, and a bit of a Don Juan, as it turns out. Um, in Mann, there is a meeting of students where they debate many of the same philosophical issues which are going on in what I'm now about to show you, another extract, where we have um, Busoni mashing together Platonic idealism, uh, theology, uh, 
a natural philosopher speaks about the nature of existence, and a lawyer. And uh, they exhaust their arguments and turn around to Faust, who's looking a bit depressed. Maybe the beer was uh, too warm even for him. And so, well, Doctor, what's it all about? And basically, Faust comes with this uh, wonderful um, summation to everything we just heard, which is, well, you can't really prove anything. Nothing's proven, nothing's provable. And then he goes on to focus on um, a phrase really initiated by Ma Martin Luther, which was that the important things in life are wine, women, and of course, music. You might think that's an unusual thing for Martin Luther to have said. Uh, wasn't he a rather doer, a Reformation theologian? The more you dig into Luther, the more you find quite a lot of controversy. And I'm just going to park that one right there. Uh, those who know will know what I mean. And uh, it is worth studying the, the full extent of his writings, should we say. Um, it, it, in this um, meeting in the pub, there is a fantastic parody. Busoni was a great humorist in music, and he writes a phenomenal parody of uh, Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, which we're not going to have time to explore that. I want to just uh, play you a little bit of this, um, the tavern scene. It's in French. Uh, they're basically having an argument uh, uh, about the nature of existence. <laughs> Sorry, I'll just restart that. So there we have um, uh, the tavern scene. Let me just summarize. Um, but what about what Plato said about idealism? The theologian, what God's created cannot be destroyed. The jurist, under the law, everything is protected. Uh, the natural philosopher, everything's going to decay and always change without ceasing the law of entropy. So what do you say, Faust? Let's hear the master, they all say. And Faust, in his rather bored and cynical way, nothing is proven, nothing is provable. In every study, I have erred anew. All we know is that we come here but to go hence. What lies between, that's what concerns us most. Here I remind you of that great and good Protestant whose words still live. And then there's the big... Um, sort of a good-natured conflict as the students try and thrash out um, what they really believe. It, it's a wonderful scene, but it's Busoni's engagement with um, 
the, 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 a lot of the philosophical ideas of his day and before, and, and really the search for meaning, which I think was key uh, to a lot of the um, revolutionary activities in the um, late 1800s and, and early 20th century. Indeed, um, the lead up to World War I would, would also be um, perhaps a consideration if we look back at um, literature, arts, music around this time, uh, things are falling apart as um, Yeats writes um, and publishes in, in 1924, The Second Coming. A lot of ideas just being thrown around, societies collapsing in many ways and leading to World War I. Um, so the legacy of Faust, uh, Busoni was, was very concerned um, about the state of the world and I think in his own way was was seeking um, to make sense of things uh, particularly when his own from among his own students which he had many there was the potential that they could find themselves on either side of the conflict uh, which was a, a terrible tragedy for him um, the opera itself but was only writes um, this wonderful phrase so many metals cast into the fire I think he's identifying himself with the idea of the alchemist here. Uh, does my alloy contain sufficient gold? If so, then seek it out for your own hoard. It's an invitation uh, to us, really, to to look into uh, what Busoni was about. Um, a little bit of background on his thinking. I think Busoni is a fascinating character, and um, this is an, an architectural map. He was quite obsessed with architecture. And um, here's an architectural design of his, not for a place he wanted to live, uh, but uh, for a piece of music. Uh, actually, the Fantasia Contrapuntistica, uh, which is a hybrid work based around Bach, which divides itself into these um, fantastic uh, structural blocks. The number three is very important here, as we'll find out in the opera. Please go and hear that uh, work. It's, it's ubiquitous on YouTube. Um, it's a wonderful uh, piece of music. And the piano concerto, um, very notorious. Um, it's not performed very often because of its colossal difficulty in execution, uh, but that's not why it's remarkable. Many works are incredibly hard to play um, and so are obscure and many works deserve that obscurity. However, some works are very challenging and difficult to play, difficult to listen to, but really must be revisited. And I would, of course, uh, believe that to be true of the concerto. But what's of interest here is, is Busoni's guide map. We have five movements. This dawning over this um, classical temple uh, symbolizes the sun rising, of course, in the east. Um, we, we have here a, a mystical, mythical creature, um, which marks, if you like, uh, nascent life and, and, and the springing out, uh, the unstoppable force of, of nature, if you like. Okay, the Sphinx, guarding the entrance to this tomb with um, obvious Egyptian symbolism. There's a flame inside. This 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 will remind anyone of um, perhaps imagery associated with temples. Perhaps it's not not uh, fanciful to propose um, because Busoni would have been acquainted uh, with his Old Testament, and if he was acquainted with Freemasonry, Solomon's Temple. But let's look at this as an Egyptian tomb. It's pyramid shaped, though not a pyramid, and it's got a big sphinx in front of it. Um, here we have Mount Vesuvius erupting uh, with these tall, I, I, I guess they're cypress trees. I'm willing to be corrected on that. Um, the fourth movement of the, by, by the way, I should say this symbolizes the third movement, uh, which is very, very dark actually in content and really the heart of the concerto. Uh, movement four symbolizes, it's called Alla Italiana. And it's really funny. First time I heard of it, uh, my, my, my first reference point was it sounds exactly like the opening of the movie the godfather where they're having the wedding music and it's so incongruous you have the deep seriousness of all this stuff in movements one and three 
and then it's it's almost as if you can you can't unsee that once you've seen it um but that was part of busoni's character he was italian and i gather he liked to drink wine and uh, he was certainly a convivial sort of character the fifth movement again we've got this mystical egyptian winged figure the fifth movement is a setting of a poem by the danish a poet Ullenschlager who wrote a drama called Aladdin and the final movement is a hymn to Allah um, not with any particular religious connotations Debussy was uh, sorry Busoni was not particularly religious I would say he was spiritual I wouldn't necessarily necessarily say he was traditionally religious but certainly the last movement um, is a remarkable piece of music there's a choir it's well worth a listen so aspects of the archaic and esoteric we've covered quite a lot of these aspects already um busoni precedes the opera with a spoken introduction and really what's happening here is if you can imagine uh, you go to the opera and we did not see this in in the production that i uh it played for us but Bozoni's intention was for a poet uh, to, to walk out and recite quite a lengthy poem, essentially. All written, Bozoni wrote his own libretto, which is remarkable, actually. The words to this opera, the libretto, were composed a good while before he set pen to music paper. So he'd been thinking about this subject matter, I would argue, since he was a teenager. When he wrote um, a piece based on a legend of a fisherman that sells his soul to the devil, uh, there's a common theme there. But Busoni begins this um, speech to the audience before the opera begins with um, I'll just read a couple of phrases. I won't read the whole thing. We'll be here a very long time. In childhood's far off day, I watched in thrall a play in which the devil took a part. That which my childish mind had once appalled. I knew in manhood for a work of art. My conscious thought that early thrill recalled, and then from knowledge could construction start. Within the seed, the germ of life is packed, and childish dreams begat creative act. And so, what we're seeing is Buzzoni's obsession. If, if you like, started in what he would consider his childhood. And it, it's it's um, fairly easy to, to trace this through his life, his engagement with the occult, his engagement with uh, spiritual matters, and following these themes through. It, he was I don't think he was a morbid character. I mean, there are certain composers that you, you could think, a lot of morbidity going on there. But I think that there is sufficient joy and exuberance in Busoni's music that gives the lie to the idea he was sitting around depressed, contemplating his own death. I, I think he was always looking to, to the future and a bright future at that. Um, I'm going to give you a short example here of music Busoni wrote as a teenager. And it shows you that this was not typical kind of. Um, teenage music but it, it does it does come from that period when he was engaging uh with um these these concepts uh particularly the, the stories of health um his his piece the racconti fantistici and these other these other ideas a short extract from his prelude in b minor again this is a teenage work I'm going to have to, for reasons of time, uh, stop it there. Uh, if one of my teenage composition students rocked up with a, a piece like that, I'd be very interested. Um, Ronald Stevenson, um, unfortunately no longer with us, eminent 
uh, composer, Busoni scholar, and fabulous pianist um, <clears throat> who lived up uh, outside of Edinburgh, um, argues that this particular piece shows the inception in Busoni's life and thinking of a Faustian idiom. And he's talking there about um, the use of harmony or, or chords. Uh, basically, is why it sounds a bit unusual. Uh, coming in from a, a tradition from Liszt and Brahms, uh, Busoni's already going off his own directions. Um, das Wunder ist ihr Heimland. This is from the um, the, the poet's speech where um, he's saying that, that, that music is is uh, really a product um, of the homeland of of the wonderful. Um, I've said that in a very clumsy way. There's a better way of saying it. Um, someone will know how to translate that a lot better than I will. But I think Busoni's music is, is always based in the contingent, the the esoteric, the, these these sort of things you can't quite if, if, elusive elusive qualities. Um, in his own day, he had a strange reputation. Although he was regarded as the preeminent pianist in the world after Liszt, it, but that vastly overshadowed his other activities. He was a poet, he was a philosopher, a musicologist, and obviously a composer and a teacher. And yet uh, the reputation was always a bit controversial. Uh, Bernard van Dieren, a composer definitely worth checking out, um, has this wonderful phrase that he was regarded by the wider musical public with armed indifference. In other words, how could such a fabulous pianist write such crazy words and music? Um, Kogan, the, the uh, Russian pianist and pedagogue, um, talks about how, how Busoni's efforts encountered bitterly divergent opinions. And that's even seen today, uh, to be honest. Um, here, here in the, uh, the poet's prologue, Busoni's saying that um, he was he was pulled uh, that this 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 idea of um, of of um, mysticism and music, the combination of mysticism and music if you like pulled pulled to him and his library is as I said full of works which uh, show show more than interest with the esoteric the arcane mystical and spiritual and obviously in the early twentieth century I mean the the, the very roots of uh, organisations. Uh, for example, um, organizations of a speculative uh, mystical nature find their roots, uh, obviously, in antiquity, but also the early 20th century is a very important time for occultism to enter uh, mainstream thinking. Um, there are some other composers around this time who uh, obviously should go hand in hand with any mention of Busoni, which would be uh, Liszt's late music. Um, Scriabin, whose work Prometheus was one of the first to feature instructions for, for a light show. And by the way, it's going to be performed in London on May the 11th at the Festival Hall. Well worth going to see uh, Scriabin's Prometheus with light show. Uh, the Polish composer Szymanowski, uh, around this time, 1924, composed a wonderful opera, King Roger, which, again, is, the, the focus is a lot on... Um, uh, comparative religious experience and personal enlightenment. It's absolutely fantastic and hand in hand should be considered alongside Busoni for different reasons. Um, after the uh, tavern scene debate, um, what we're finding here, the, the, after the opera, there is a, there is a if you like, a, a, a postlude where, where the poet comes out again and explains what we've seen. Everything finishes, um, and the poet comes and says, uh, "Von Menschen Sehnsucht war vor eure Blicken den Abend durch ein Tunnelbild entrollt," which is essentially a history of man and his desire. This night, the sound of music has been told. Doesn't say the history of a man, i.e., Faust. It says, a history of man and his desire. And I think this is the important thing about Dr. Faust for me, the opera, is that it speaks to the human experience. 
Unfortunately, Busoni did not live to finish Dr. Faust. He did leave extensive notes, and there have been completions made by initially his student Philip Janach, um, musicologist Anthony Beaumont, the 1980s, and most recently Larry Sitsky, uh, the, the student of um, Egon Petri, Busoni's disciple. And one of the key elements of this completion is that Busoni wanted this phrase where Faust, in, in Christopher Marlowe's version, you'll know that Faust in a very grisly way is ripped to pieces by the devil on his way down to hell. It's incredibly Renaissance, incredibly don't fool around with organized religion, don't fool around with the devil, it'll end up badly. However, uh, perhaps in a more enlightened uh, time, Busoni writes this phrase. Faust comes to this uh, maturity. And you, you can read the phrase here. It's, it, it's, it's, very, um, it's very pointed. And I think the key here is, in myself, one freedom, expire both God and devil at once. Uh, I, d I don't want this to be misunderstood. I, I don't think Busoni was writing off the existence of a, for want of a better phrase, a supreme being at all. But I think the disenchantment with organized religion, its structures and the outcomes, which are embedded in uh, the Renaissance Faust and um, Busoni's modern Faust, um, show that he wanted to reach beyond. Um, the midpoint of Dr. Faust has this symbol. Now, Busoni does write again in that he has the poet say, still exhausted are all, all the symbols weight that in this work are hidden and concealed. Their germs a later school shall procreate, whose fruits to those unborn shall be revealed. This is a, a, a symbol that Busoni drew about halfway through the opera, halfway through the action, forming a, a, a sort of chiasmus or crossover point. You know, famously, you could say, well, this is the Cairo symbol. Um, you could say it's an, an X, it's a cross. It's, I would say it's a crossover point where everything becomes inverted. Uh, the, the, the magician, the alchemist Faust becomes a, a wiser Faust who comes to a, an enlightenment. Mephistopheles, who had ultimate power over Faust, has less and less power towards the end of the opera and literally fades out in insignificance. Um, it's, I will be writing, obviously, more about this. Um, a, a later school will produce the fruit of Busoni's um, music and thought, and that's certainly true. Um, this is a recording I made of... Um, one of Busoni's uh, revolutionary works that caused a riot at its first performance. The Rite of Spring was not the only radical piece uh, to be performed in the early 1900s. If you want to hear this, please let me know. I'm happy to uh, point you in the direction of a copy of Sonatina Secunda. And um, lastly, if you like, um, where Busoni says, so, rising on the shoulders of the past, the soul of man shall reach his heaven at last. Let each take what is found appropriate. The seed is sown, others may reap the field. Certainly, um, there have been many composers, um, and this is where I'd like to refer uh, to the great work and research of Erin Knitt, who's written extensively on composers who really would not have persisted in their work were it not for the influence of Busoni. Um, certainly true of Sibelius, certainly true of Edgar Varese, uh, Sarabji, Stevenson, Michael Finnessy, Alastair Hinton in our own times. Um, there are many that owe so much to this, this uh, one composer and legacy. Um, that's everything I wanted to say today. It's not everything I wanted to say, <laughs> but it's, it's everything I wanted to say for now. I would really value feedback, questions, input, um, thank you for bearing with me. I tried to get a, a lot in a, a few minutes there. There is much more to be said. And um, my own researchers at the moment are focusing on this 
early 20th century period of um, the emerging of modern Faust. I'm looking at Goethe as being the, the end of the Romantic Faust. There is one Faust version by Vischer, which is a parody of Goethe. And then there's a serious Faust by Avenarius, which I'd argue is the proto-modern Faust. Um, Busoni knew of his work. I'm sure Thomas Mann did. And then Thomas Mann and Busoni's treatments, although they didn't actually formally know each other, they are full of very striking synchronicities, plot ideas, language, which I'm writing about right now. And there are so many modern Faust versions that nobody talks about. So I'm hoping to get all these into the uh, debate. And um, thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much indeed, Fred. Um, I'm just going to ask you if you could please just, I'll, I'll uh, um, reclaim the, uh, uh, the screen sharing, so the hosting. Fingers crossed this should be uh, done. Let's see. So, no, it doesn't seem to be the case. I'm trying to, uh, let me see, just one second. Oh, I, I understand why, one sec. Sorry, it's just little technicalities there with uh, Zoom. Um, Fred, that was absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much. Thank you very um, much. I have a, a several um, uh, observations and, and questions for you, but before I, I, I launch into that, I'm gonna just curb myself and, um, and uh, open this up to everybody else. So um, please feel free as is customary after the presentation, we have a, an open uh, discussion and sharing really, any thoughts, ideas uh, or, or comments um, on the subject matter, please feel free. It would be very helpful as I moderate this if people who wish to um, ask a question or raise a comment, uh, please in the Zoom, uh, bottom part of the screen, you'll see the reactions. And if you could please just raise your hand, that would be uh, very, very helpful just for me to moderate the questions. So please go ahead if anyone has any particular questions for, uh, for Fred, if you could raise your hand or even just speak up, um, first come, first served. I'm being very patient. So uh, if, if, nobody, if nobody does step forward with any particular question, then I certainly will. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, Fred, you know, you, you, you obviously have so much of a passion for this, this subject and, and um, uh, that's, that's very, very evident. Um, I, wanted to, I wanted to ask you, um, many, many years ago, uh, a very good friend of mine um, recommended that I, I read a book and uh, this particular book, it, it was titled, um, it was by a, an author called Jacques Attali, um, who used to be a, a financial advisor or something like this for Francois Mitterrand, um, the old French president. And uh, it's called Noise, the Political Economy of Sound. Um, are you, have you heard of the book? Oh, I haven't. Um, I must check that out. Um, so this made a huge impression upon me. Basically, he, he, he very, very um, eloquently puts forward a hypothesis that um, throughout the entirety of musical history, um, at certain times, the, the underlying form and structure of popular music has gone through numerous changes and developments, like what was regarded as, um, you know, the, the, the way music should be back in the day, you know, way back. Um, and then you get these people who are completely heretical and they do things completely differently and can be shunned by their peers and, uh, and so on. The same goes for art in general, but, but musically, uh, he puts forward the hypothesis that whenever there's been a, a change and a, and a development in the commonly accepted form and structure of music, that that new sound 
has been a precursor to great and powerful societal transformation. That it's almost like the, the changing of the sound of popular music uh, heralds the change in society that's about to happen. Do you have any thoughts on this uh, particular subject in relation maybe to, you said that uh, it was a very, um, uh, an, an unusual uh, uh, approach uh, that Bosoni had, is that, is that, would that be true to say? Yeah, this is a fascinating um, idea that you bring up. Um, I think it was Plato that said, when the music changes, society changes. Uh -huh. And that's an extension of, of that idea. And I think when I'm teaching music history, I'm doing a class at the moment um, at uh, City, and the class is about Western music in the context of history. And we just finished uh, talking about, the well, we're talking about the period around going into the First World War, and next week it will be the interwar years. And there's two ways of looking at it, really. It's either there is music and art that is produced as a result of what is happening, um, or there is music and art that preempts what is happening because it summons, um, well, that phrase, a bit overused phrase, the zeitgeist or mm -hmm. the weltgeist, if you like. Okay, there's a mood, there's an atmosphere. And, you know, I, th I think certainly you can, you can analyze this out in terms of its economic trends and um, do you need to be particularly prosperous to have a thri thriving musical expression? And I think, no, actually, mm -hmm. I, th I think art can be produced in, in situations of terrible circumstance uh, as, well as, as well as plenty. Um, there are examples of, of both. Um, so I, I don't think it's, it's, it's sort of cut and dried that, that the art follows the history or the art precedes the history, but but what I think is important with um, just take this opera for example. What I would like to think can happen is that when when we engage with a work of art like this, which is unfamiliar, that has certain themes, I mean certainly common to the interests of everyone who would have joined today. These will speak to the ideas of, of transcendence, um, contempl deep contemplations of eternity, our place in the universe, um, our relationship to that universe and the forces that create and sustain and end it. Um, I think Busoni contemplated all these things and I think he's trying to get us to think beyond the, the finitude of our own life. What I, what I wasn't able to say was that the traditional ending of Faust is he's either um, ripped to shreds by devils or in Goethe's Faust assumed into uh, heaven accompanied by the eternal feminine um, because of his good works that he does in part two. Uh, although he was pretty foul in part one, particularly towards Margaret or Gretchen, as she was called, leaving her with child. Um, Busoni's Faust, well, he does actually, he has an affair with a, uh, a duchess who, and that, that, that affair produces a child. And towards the end of the opera, she tries to give him the child back and say, this symbolizes your work that you must finish. And that's where Busoni bequeaths his, his soul into the body of the dead child, which then reanimates and walks off stage carrying an acacia branch, interestingly mm. enough. Um, and I think that was saying at that point in, in history, look, we've got to get beyond fighting each other because of what we believe. We've got to get beyond this pessimistic view of the, the, that man has no value. And we need to look for something outside of the traditional, the normative ideas that we've had. A lot of these things don't work. And there's a transcendent uh, reality that we can, we can strive to build. And I think we don't see that again, uh, dare I say it, until the finale of uh, Kubrick's 2001, where we have the famous space baby, which is, if you like, the rebirth mm. of 
us uh, in a primal state to give it another go. And certainly, I think that's Buzoni's idea. Look, I, my you know my life's exhausted, and he, he didn't live to finish. And in the opera, Faust physically dies, but his will, mm -hmm. his will, is the thing that goes on. And I think that's the message. And your original point, um, I hope I haven't strayed too far away from it, is that I think music can preempt, illustrate, and comment on any kind of reality. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you very much, uh, Fred. Um, anybody else, uh, please feel free, put your hand up or, or just ask or speak. That would be that would be greatly appreciated. Otherwise, I would love to continue <laughs> the conversation. Um, I, I find this subject fascinating, Fred, really deeply fascinating. Um, so you mentioned as well uh, that um, about about the uh, the child and the intention or the will being sent forward, if you like, um, and that um, uh, there was a, a phrase in one of your slides that referred to um, the 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 planting the work the work the planting of the seed, and that there will be those who come later who will. Um, paraphrasing, tend to the seed and take that work further. Um, how do you feel about uh, that particular comment in relation to where we are now in the grand scheme of, of developments uh, worldwide, uh, the current state of humanity and, and uh, our aspirations, hopefully, for a better future? This is a very interesting question to me, and I I, I talk about this with, um, with with students. Does music can music does music have the power to affect the world? Can it change people? And I think the answer to that is obviously yes. <clears throat> and I think I think Bozzoni's desire was that he could encode within his work uh, sufficient depth that if 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 it were the intention. Uh, of someone going into that work, it's not too hard to figure out what he's really saying to us. Uh, having said that, it might be harder in the case of James Joyce in relation to the book Finnegan's Wake, um, which is it's difficult to understand. Doesn't mean it's it's not a great work or, or Ulysses. Doesn't mean they're not great works with value. Um, it just means is there? Do I read? in order to gain moral enlightenment? Am I reading to pass the time? Uh, am I reading um, junk literature in the, the junk food that's not going to sustain me but will make me feel full for a little while? Um, I, I think there is a Busoni influence, which is undoubted in the 20th century music and thought. And we're going to be exploring this in 2024. Um, there's a group of us, um, Musoni scholars around the world, including um, Erin, who um, joined us from Boston, um, colleagues in London, colleagues uh, in, in Europe, um, in the States, Australia, to debate these issues. What is the state of Musoni scholarship? How much of an influence has he had? I mean, look, I, in, in the lecture next week, I'm going to talk about um, music between the between the the two world wars in Berlin. Obviously, we had cabaret music. Um, we had a composer called Kurt Weil, who wrote the Thropeny Opera, Mac the Knife, and also um, the Rise and Fall of the City of Mahagoni. And there's a famous song in that called the uh, Alabama Song, which is um, a very interesting song about uh, whiskey. And I'm going to be playing the original version. Uh, of Kurt Weill, sung by his wife Lottie Lenya, and covered in 2002 by none other than David Bowie. Now, what's the, the so what? Well, Kurt Weill's teacher was Busoni. So this connection, um, he's ubiquitous. Any contemporary composer will be able to trace some influence back on their ideology, or their musicianship, or, or the provenance of their own instrumental learning back to Busoni or, the, or his network of pupils. So certainly um, 
there's a lot to sort of get stuck into um, in in the opera, and that's what I'm seeking to do with the research. Is to I don't think I'll be able to exhaust it, but to get as as close as possible to all of the ideas that we discussed today that can be of value. I hope that, that sort of answers uh, that one. Yeah. Fred, thank you. Um, when you talk about your research and, and the fact that in is it 2024 you're going to be gathering with all these other scholars, um, there, there's, there's doing historical research, but in terms of the seeds which were planted, um, would, you, would you agree that there are other forms of research uh, beyond the historical? which would be how one could maybe uh, um, take those seeds that were sown back then and uh, use them creatively based upon certain understandings that have come through your studies historically um, in order to create something which is of relevance for now and the times we're moving into? Well, the Certainly, I would like to see uh, through exposing the works, uh, the music works and the writings and, and debating the philosophies to create that environment where people can, can be exposed to these ideas and let the seeds germinate. Um, I, I claim no authority um, on the particular composer at all. I, I think let's get it out there. Let's share it. Let's talk about it. Um, because there's a lot in there. There's a lot. It's like it's like a packet of seeds. You know, no, nothing's going to happen to it unless it gets distributed. And I, I think that's the key point that you bring up there. And I think time will tell. Time will show um, that the value of these ideas inherently. And there's a certain Darwinian principle in music that um, there's a lot of neglected music out there that deserves its neglect. And there's a lot of neglected music that really should be heard. I mentioned Shimonovsky's opera, King Roger. That needs to be done. It's a fabulous, it would speak to the spiritual emptiness that a lot of people feel today. It really, really would, as would, as would this one. There's, wow. a, there's a hand up, actually. Yes, there is. Stephen. Uh, go ahead, please, Stephen. Sorry, I, I, I forgot, forgot that I'd muted myself. I mean, absolutely fascinating. I mean, and I, I think that I mean, a, a lot of my, what I'm interested in is allegorical texts. And of course, this raises the topic of allegorical opera and music. And, and in, in a sense, in a text, some of the meaning can be abstracted in words. Here, the abstraction um, of meaning is in terms of some of the music as well as uh, the libretto and there are all sorts of odd, odd associations that were arising in my mind as you were talking from Kubrick's The Space Odyssey to, to Ulysses uh the, the the novel title Ulysses on 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 the on the Odyssey and then of course and whilst I haven't heard heard the piece you uh pick out the fact that the, the similarity of uh, music by Bassoni and The Godfather and of course, the Godfather itself is a three-part, well, a, a trilogy of films that charts the descent of a hero that is supposed to be separate from the evil of the fathers, from the family business, but who inevitably embraces it by a series of events partly beyond his control. Um, and, and the finale is expressed beyond, in a sense, purely film and dialogue, in, in an operatic performance, um, Cavaliera Rusticana that mirrors the um, brutal events within the Mafia family with the uh, events within uh, Mascani's um, opera. So, so in a sense, in, in, in a way, what, you, you, what you're talking about spreads out beyond the limitations of one piece in, into themes, it sort of, uh, which I think is the characteristic of great drama or art, that suddenly it's not simply about what you see or hear, it's about who you are, the meaning of, of one's life, the purpose, uh, 
why we're here. Uh, I mean, the other thing that struck me about the teenage uh, Bersonia is how it just said, to, communicated to me something about Sati as well, that those, those isolated themes almost of a, 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 going back to uh, a, 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 a monastic set of set of tones. So I mean, thank you very much, first of all, for introducing to me to a composer I knew nothing of and a, a work uh, that, that I've, I've not seen. Um, I mean, I suppose the, the, what question that comes back to me is that often those people that are attracted to great, a great piece of art um, find within that art something that speaks both to themselves and their experience as well as what's universal. And, and so what would interest me is to, is, is for you to, clearly this work has been part of your musical life for a long period of time and has drawn you into a, a deeper and deeper study. And has that, what, what I suppose that, I mean, it seems uh, maybe a little too personal, but in a sense, has that spoken to you of, big events in your own life experience and helped you understand that experience in the context of some of those bigger philosophical questions that we grapple with? Thanks for all your observations there. Um, I think that the idea of allegory is incredibly important because I think allegory is used by these artists, whether it be Shakespeare, um, whoever, whichever composer or poet, um, the list is endless, to speak to us about life. Uh, the end of Booker's, uh, Christopher Booker's work, The Seven Great Plots, he um, discusses the idea of the word protagonist and the word agon meaning to struggle and proto is like, we're all struggling. We're all the protagonist of our life story, as it were. Mm. And I think anything that we can experience um, and there are, there'll be certain patterns and tropes that, ha that happen. As you mentioned, um, the, the idea of the, the, the Godfather rhythm, the rhythm of that story is not an uncommon rhythm. It's tragedy. It's, it, it is the, the typical tragic uh, descent. And I think, I think he makes a Faustian pact with power and it consumes him. He loses his soul to power and, and as the curse is laid on him, uh, die like a dog um, on your own with just a scabby dog walking around your, your corpse. Um, I, I think in, in my own life, um, when I had a conversation with, with um, someone about SRIA and it was put to me that, look, you've got your, you've got your mundane life and that's very important, but you've, you've also really got to examine and keep examining your spiritual life and they can inform each other. It's not an either or it's, it's a sort of a both and, and, um, I, I take music very seriously to me. It is a, it is a matter of life and death. Um, it's meaning and it's, it's content and it's, it's influence on us. And I think not only the allegorical uh, connotations of, of how we live and why we live, um, but, but to, to what ultimate purpose do we do what we do every day? Um, I, I suppose for me, it's my enthusiasm for music. I, I could absolutely trace back to my uh, piano teacher, Florence Crichton. And the nobility of what she did for so many people. Um, there, there doesn't seem to be much that would be more, of more value to me than being able to communicate those musical and um, values of seeking to a, a new generation of people that, that seek enlightenment in music. I hope that answers the question. It's not too vague. <laughs> I mean, I mean, you sort of ended on the point that was as, as a, uh, of that's most fascinating is that is I mean, clearly music is central to ritual, drama, and ceremony. I mean, and 
and, and plays a part in evoking a response from the person that listens. Um, and, and therefore, what you sort of lead us towards is that it is possible to be initiated by music or by performance of music. And therefore, um, that um, I, I, I think that sort of um, some, some quality of understanding of the universe around, around them that a, a composer or a performer is able to realize is of such fundamental spiritual power that it can transform well, transmute um, in, in the alchemical term, the listener to something other than they were before they they heard it. And uh, I mean, I think we we focus on the, the spiritual transformation, but clearly there's a range of other happy, sadness, joy, all of all of those things. And and of course, like the alchemical process, how music does that of course, is still fund fundamentally not understood. And there are various harmonic models, um, Renaissance um, theories about how music, rather like how vision does it when you, when you look at a painting, when, 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 you, when you hear, hear, hear music. But I mean, I suppose that, Fred, that you, you found yourself continually changed by music and that the particular Bassoni's Faust is the thing that has within it the most transformatory experience that you've had or is that perhaps overplaying the the piece in your at your own experience? I, I mean I think the fact that I've had an engagement with it for a very long time decades and decades is incredibly important it's not as though it's the only music I'm interested in, um, but it is what I've decided to research. I mean, I'm equally um, obsessed with um, piano music of Liszt, late Beethoven, uh, the symphonic works of uh, Bruckner, for example, Franz Schmidt, um, Szymanowski, Yanis Anakis, you know, lots of other composers that I, I could point to as being a <laughs> source of obsession. Um, <laughs> but I do think your point about initiatory, I mean, I mean, music has been used for, for great good, and it's also been used for the invocation of terrible things. Um, Beethoven's music and Wagner's music was co-opted in the Second World War by the Third Reich um, to create an emotional state which would open open up minds to um, those malign influences. Um, that, that's not to say that, um, or, or the debate in our day, um, does music, does, does, does certain types of music cause young people to commit crime? Um, do we blame um, the dissolution of uh, morality on certain types of music or are those types of music commenting on what they see happening in society that's back back to a, a, a question a while ago um i don't know the answer to that but I, I i do i do see that um music is incredibly powerful uh mainly for good and i would hope that it can be um but it's, it's like anything else. You, you might say there's a religious text, which is a religious text, and it should be a force for good. And yet, if I uh, live in opposition to those ideas to the point where I want to resist them um, physically, as it were, then that, that becomes problematic. Something that is good uh, becomes something that is, is questionable or depending on which um, which football team's shirt I wear and where I wear it. That could also be a <laughs> cause of something that's great. It might, I'm supporting my team. Yes, but I hate your team. So therefore, I hate you. Um, well, it's an interesting... Uh, uh, are there other hands up? So I'll just I'll say it's one thing, and then over to Steve and Benny, is that just yesterday I was reading a piece about a decision by a Ukrainian orchestra not to play Tchaikovsky because he was Russian. 
only for the uh, a commentator in the piece in the London Times to say, but that's the entire point to play Tchaikovsky because he factually was of Ukrainian descent. And, 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 and of course, actually the point of to play Tchaikovsky is because the music is, again, transcendental uh, and goes beyond his mere um, heritage in terms of his ethnicity. But I'll, I'll stop there and, and, and over to uh, the next. Thank you very much for your uh, questions. Very, really made me think. I really, I really, I really will engage with your ideas. Wonderful. Th thank you very much, uh, Stephen. Um, Steve, if you could be a little patient, please. Benny's had his hand up first, so over to you, Benny. I think the. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, I think it's a very, very uh, interesting discussion uh, about uh, the effects uh, on the human uh, consciousness uh, uh, music have, um, and uh, also uh, music can be used for manipulation of different kinds, and it can uh, exalt people in, in, into uh, higher states of consciousness and so on. But I don't know if, if you uh, know this uh, Russian, but we talked about Russia, uh, the Russian composer Skriabin, uh, who was a Theosof, uh, uh, you know, in the beginning of the of the 20th century. He wrote some very extraordinary uh, music. Uh, his first music was romantic uh, symphonies, you know, but then he started to uh, compose some very, very unique. Uh, I never heard anyone sound like uh, Skriabin. And uh, his uh, vision was actually to compose uh, a piece of music which uh, led uh, the audience uh, into uh, enlightenment uh, using, uh, you know, um, uh, colors. Uh, its its um, tone had a color and, uh, and uh, you know, it was a, a work called Initiation, which he never uh, finished, uh, you know, but um, he, he finished some uh, uh, other extraordinary pieces. And I don't know if you know this uh, composer. He, I think uh, he's, he's quite interesting. And also uh, the idea of um, bringing uh, people to consciousness, uh, you know, to a higher uh, uh, state of consciousness through the music, uh, I find uh, interesting. I'm gonna put a link here for you, Benny. Um, which this relates to a performance that's happening. I mentioned this on May 11th. Um, this is um, a performance of uh, Prometheus. Oh, yeah. I don't know if you're anywhere near the South Bank, but it would be um, wonderful. Um, I, I'm planning to go there. I, I hope you can make it as well. It's, it's not often that the, these big works of Scriabin get performed. You're quite right. Uh, Busoni knew Scriabin, and there was a meeting where Busoni had done a concert in Moscow, and in the audience, wow. uh, Scriabin was there, Rachmaninoff was there, and the pianist Yosef Hoffman was there. And interesting comment Busoni makes to his wife in a letter was, um, yes, it's, it was great to see Scriabin. He's incredibly ambitious to do incredible things with his music, and Hoffman was there, the pianist, fabulous pianist. Oh yeah, and Rachmaninoff was there too. Mm. So it, it's interesting. <laughs> I, I, I don't want to read too much into that comment, but you could imagine a rather introverted Rachmaninoff being slightly overwhelmed by Buzoni's character, a very um, southern, vibrant, lively, very different from the dour Sergei, you know, but... Mm -hmm. um, Anyway, I've sent you that link, so do do um, do have a look if it's of interest to you. But 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 thanks for that point. Scriabin is definitely a composer that needs to be explored, no question. Thank you very much. Thank you, Benny. Um, Fred, would you be able to share that link uh, in general to the chat for people? Oh yeah, most definitely. I'm, Thank I'm you. I should have done that, shouldn't I? Uh, that would be really helpful. There it is. Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, please. Uh, kind of copy that link that Fred sent, uh, make, make a point of saving that for those who are interested. And um, uh, I'd like to hand over to Steve. Thanks for your patience, Steve. Thanks, Shane, can you hear me? Yeah, very clearly. Hi, Steve. Oh, fantastic. Uh, hello, Fred, how are you doing? Thank you very much um, for the <laughs> fantastic lecture today, by the way. 
a couple of questions at the moment. Um, I suppose I'd start off with um, the first one. As we mentioned about maybe frequencies or different types of music affecting the consciousness of people. Wonderful, absolutely fantastic. And there's something that I've been looking into and it seems wherever you research, I can't get a straight answer on it. And it's um, when they change the tuning for A from 432 to 440, did that, do you think there might have been a reason for that? To a, maybe 432 was more in tune with, um, with the human being and affecting us on a personal level, whereas 440 is doing something different. Now, I've seen some, um, some very, I can't get a straight answer, to be honest with you. What are, you, what are your thoughts on that, Fred? I, I, think it, I think it completely depends on the sensitivity of the individual, although there are certain things that will happen if you, if you take uh, experiments that you've probably seen done with a, with a steel plate with grains of salt or sand on it, which is then made to vibrate with a violin bow. And you get these amazing geometric patterns. There is no question that sound, the harmonic series, um, as the ancient Greeks framed it, is incredibly impacting on the psyche. Um, tuning, again, we, the, the, the tunings that we use today, especially for the piano, are compromised tunings. So um, our Western system has kind of approximated uh, the scale so that we can play a larger range of notes and they don't sound out of tune with each other. Um, but this is the difference between true temperament and equal temperament. And I take your point about the frequency. I don't know why we have A440, to be honest. Um, there is an argument that earlier music would have would have had notes that we would have perceived as being lower. Um, I have colleagues who uh, have perfect pitch, who are incredibly disturbed by any frequency other than 440. Um, I've got a fabulous um, friend, uh, a wonderful, wonderful concert pianist, if he plays on a piano that is not precisely in tune, he tries to change his position on the keyboard and it completely throws him off because he, he's like, I cannot, this, this piano is out of tune, My, everything's out of tune, I can't do this. Now, I don't have that uh, condition, uh, so I, I can play on any old piano you like. I've, I've taught people as well who have, have a condition called synesthesia, which is, we'll play them a note, let them tell you what the note is, give it a frequency, and then tell you the color of that note. It's red, it's green, it's purple, whatever. And they, they see a, a ring of color around their peripheral vision when they hear certain sounds. I, I don't have yeah, okay. any part of that. So um, here's the thing, we mentioned a minute ago that, very briefly actually, that perhaps certain types of music um, might affect uh, younger people and, and, and drive them in a certain uh, course of action, you know? Um, and and that, 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 that particular one, I've got, a, I've got a real opinion on that one. I mean, I'm probably the last person in the world who you would think has got a penchant for gangster rap, and it's never done me any harm. <laughs> in fact, <laughs> In, in fact, I think um, I know some of the some of, some of the topics that particularly the Eminem and uh, Biggie Smalls and people like that speak about are quite foul. But the music as a as a, as a, as a form of art, almost as a form of poetry, is is absolutely fantastic. Although I don't agree necessarily with some of the subject matter. So I'm I'm thinking purely from a a, a musical perspective here. So. Um, but, but I would like to finish off there by saying, Fred, thank you very much for a most thought-provoking lecture today. I'm certainly going to be thinking about it for some time, and I will be watching it back again as well on the, on the YouTube, what's name, <clears throat> just to go over it again, because there's always good to go over these things twice. But from me, thanks very much. And please, work, please, my friend. please be in touch um, with any... You, you mentioned um, gangster. It was interesting, because one of the other things I do is I, I do forensic musicology which is looking at copyright infringement. And um, 
that's an interesting area because you do have an awful lot of rap music which uses samples and um i'm currently looking at um I, I cannot go into any details but i'm currently looking at um some music that would have been around in our comparative uh in in my comparative youth which is now resurfacing uh, underneath some uh, dubious uh verbal expressions should we say over the top um and we're examining sort of copyright issues there um but under as, as a genre it's very compelling i will say uh so i I'm, I'm with you on that it might seem unlikely that someone like me would have that on his playlist but i do actually <laughs> <laughs> So that's great, great points. Thanks for your observations, and please be in touch. I'm afraid that that comes comes because it's an interesting point. Because in a sense, there's always been art. There's always been this art sort of fear that art is becoming more decadent, more contemporary art of whatever sort is is loses its content, is dis spiritually disturbing, is 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 corrupting, and and in a sense, perhaps because the. the, the, the the way in which music is shared and changes more recently has, has felt as if it's changing more more rapidly, but but in but in some ways, presumably there was uh, what you've Bassoni's music would have been controversial at its time, and and that con controversy could have pointed out whether it's corrupting, whether the theme is not sufficient sufficiently sort of improving, so. So don't don't we have this sort of moral panic? Uh, isn't the moral panic we feel part of the moral panic that every age has had because of its perceptions over what the purpose of art is? Is it to improve and spiritualize? But to be consciously doing that may not, of course, be uh, the point because isn't the point of art to talk about the present moment? And if that present moment is understood through music, then that's transformatory, rather than to sort of try and affect a change without sufficient um, insight or, um, well, uh, so in, insight or, or, or to be uh, as, as able to understand how the art form, in this case, music can affect change. And so, so do we worry too much about whether art and music is corrupting uh, when actually as humans we're probably quite resilient to that i think because it happens in every single generation um every every generation has got its own music of outrage its own protest songs um its own songs that signal moral decline um i i think there would have been um an awful lot of controversy in every generation about the types of music that, um, that their, their respective moral value. Um, it's interesting that one of Busoni's pieces, the, the Piano Sonatina Number no. 2, uh, caused a riot at its first performance. It's a short piano work. I've recorded it. I played it a lot. Never had a riot at <laughs> one of those concerts. Um, but certainly in its day, it, it, it was received with... Um, real shock actually um but then you know we, we might play music today from the 1980s and say what's all the fuss about you know, um, what is, fred, what fred sorry to interrupt could i ask you just briefly what was the fuss about what was it that was so um uh, perceived or received as such a radical thing um i would leave that to the judgment of anyone that listens to it because I could understand why in that particular time it would have been extremely hard to hear. But here's the interesting thing. The piece was uh, published in 1913, yet it contains all the main themes in shorthand that then, then occur um, 11 years later in the opera. So there is significance in the use of the sounds significance in the use of the harmonies and some of the unfamiliar and unpleasant nature of the music probably does cause a bit of a a, a, a frank examination in spiritual terms 
that, that's not over-egging it, by the way. I think it's absolutely the, the, the true impact of that piece is uh, extraordinary for its relative brevity. Okay, th thank you very much. Um, Chris, over to you, sir. Thank you. Um, Fred, I was thinking of kind of a parallel universe, but uh, jazz that was called the devil's music and was oh. considered to be, you know, wayward and untoward. And it's journey that it took, you know, all the way through John Coltrane, um, who worked on new tunings, who endlessly searched for new notes in between and beyond to try to express more in music because he found um, what was already there was limiting to him. And even there would become uh, the church of John Coltrane. There's one in San Francisco. So a lot of spirituality felt through that music rather than being the devil's music in the end of days. Um, what's your thoughts about jazz, its place in music history and its change in tunings and things of that nature? It's morphing with the times. It certainly uh, became different animals over different decades and became different in meaning and purpose to the people who created it. Um, everything from religious to political leanings, if you will. Well, the, the, the interesting the thing I'm very fortunate to have had is um, I had two older brothers um, who uh, were significantly older. Uh, they were born during World War II. Um, I came along many years uh, after that. But my infancy, from when I was a very young kid, I was listening to Ornette Coleman's The Shape of Jazz to Come, uh, Coltrane, Love Supreme, um, all of it, Rollins, the lot, George Russell, The Living Chromatic Concept, yeah. whoever it was. I mean, this, Frank Zappa, this was, this was stuff I was listening to before I reached double digits. And that vocabulary, um, it's interesting that Busoni writes about the future of music and how the division into 12 semitones is incredibly limiting. And he devised um, plans for dividing the octave into 33 distinct sounds, different tunings. He prophesies electronic music and ultimately says, look, in order to hear the music of the future, we're going to have to leave the planet anyway. So he was really thinking outside of his environment in the in the early 20s you know um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but I, I think yeah jazz jazz music was heavily castigated uh, as being uh, uh, the music of the devil i i think it was, i think there are other elements at play other than just taste um i, I think you've got to look at um a, a certain uh, provenance of where the music originates and the people that originated it and prejudices against them sure and, you know that's it's obviously um horrendous but um but one of one of busoni's incredible contributions to this debate would have been that he was incredibly interested in native american music one of his students um one of his students was natalie curtis who produced this i hope it's not really very clear is it it's it's called um, The Indian's Book, and it's Natalie Curtis in the 20s cataloging and compiling as much music as she could from Native Americans. Oh, wow. In order to preserve their legacy. And it's a book of uh, 500 odd pages. And she had, she'd consulted with the uh, venerable um, tribal leaders and um, there's a foreword in this book. I'd like, just like to, to read you a little extract from this. A foreword sure, by uh, Hiamovi, the high chief among the Cheyennes and the Dakotas. Um, there are, this is how he finishes his, uh, his preface. Uh, there are birds of many colors, red, blue, green, yellow, yet it's all one bird. There are horses of many colors, yet it's all one horse. So cattle, all living things, animals, flowers, trees, and with men. In this land where once were only Indians are now men of every color, white, black, yellow, red, yet all one people. That this should come to pass was in the heart of the great mystery. It is right thus, and everywhere there shall be peace. Now, isn't that a tragedy? But Busoni wrote 
music based around these melodies to preserve them and promulgate them because certainly his desire would have been for universal peace and certainly the the high chief that wrote these words was to see the demise of that ideal and mm -hmm. don't we live that every single day in our world sure. now we, we, this is an yes. open-hearted man saying let's all just live together we're, we're as we're as different as flowers horses insects animals and we can we can live together mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. i i think it's it's a shame that music then becomes partitioned into um um controversies of ethnicity of ethnicity right i don't like that music because it is blank because it is i i think to to the composer busoni it was all one thing yes and that's the power of that legacy and the seeds so I'd urge, I'd urge anyone to check out um, Natalie Curtis's work. Um, it's not all that well known, but it's a, it's an amazing catalogue of um, ethnomusicology, if you like. That's fascinating. I know the Smithsonian was working, and this was some years back. I don't know how much funding they have for this, but there are old wax cylinders that they took out in areas of native uh, uh, tribes, and they would record their music. And so this stuff is is trying to be preserved now digitally because of course this old beeswax cylinders are, are melting and decaying so um there's kind of the race is on to save some of that old compositional uh structure and things that that is becoming lost you know which would be a massive massive um indictment of yeah. us as a society to ignore that and yet um you know, there are, there are 100,000 new songs released to all streaming platforms every single day. Well, wow. um, I know this because the global copyright industry is worth about $50 billion a year, or it was last year. And you think, well, okay, well, we are saving some things, but my goodness, we are losing some very valuable things. Um, that kind of There's... Upsets, upsets me a bit because obviously in dealing with the, the copyright issues they're important but isn't it <laughs> isn't it also important to preserve the legacies of the past i agree that you know there's some major warehouse fires that took out a lot of music years ago scott walker things of that nature that you'll never get back you know and um yes uh, we tend to throw away things from the past and discount their value and value and covet only what the new latest greatest thing is. So um, that's one of the fallacies of mankind. <laughs> Thank you so much for uh, your points. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Where, Thank where, you. Are you, where are you calling us from? California. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> Brilliant. We've traversed the states today. Yes. <laughs> been in New England, been in California. Cool. Thank you, Chris. Um, um, you, you know, Fred, you mentioned uh, in your presentation that sometimes uh, there's there's uh, wisdom to be uh, uh, to be gained by um, the inversion of archetypes. You mentioned inversion. Um, you know, uh, William Blake, when he was 32, he wrote a book called The Marriage of Heaven and Hell. Uh, and um, in, in that book, he turns upside down the common archetype of the angel and the devil. So um, an angel becomes uh, an archetype that um, symbolizes limitation and restriction on free-flowing, creative, passionate energy. Uh, and the, the, the devil becomes an archetype of free-flowing, creative, passionate energy. And uh, there's a, a, sh a short chapter in there called The Proverbs of Hell. And at the beginning, uh, I mean, this ties in potentially with the, the, to a degree uh, with uh, Faustian uh, themes. He says, he says at the beginning of the chapter, one day I found myself wandering amidst the fires of hell. So I thought to myself, just as when a person is in a foreign land, that each land contains its own inherent wisdom. Uh, I therefore uh, wondered what wisdom does hell contain? So I sought to compile the proverbs of hell and they're very short and sharp one-liners, like short sentences. Uh, um, uh, going back to the point about jazz uh, being regarded as the devil's music, there's uh, one of the sayings from that, that chapter is, um, uh, 
just as the caterpillar lays her eggs on the fairest of leaves, so the priest lays his curse on the fairest of joys. Wow. Yeah, it's sharp. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's uh, all too common, I think, that uh, um, say in, music, in musical terms, uh, people would regard music that seeks or strives to express something deeper or different would be demonized by people who are very fixed and rigid in their views. Not an uncommon thing. And even um, if, if you take the case of um, instrumentalists, Paganini, Franz Liszt, they, they were all <clears throat> considered to be that having made some deal with the devil so they could have extraordinary instrumental facility, Robert Johnson, the blues player. And today it's, it's parodied by a lot of um, <laughs> quote unquote, uh, musicians who um, will, will throw up uh, quasi mystical signs, claim, claiming some uh, affiliations, whatever, you know, come on. Um, it's, mm -hmm. it's all getting a bit tedious. Mm -hmm. but I do I do take that point with Blake. And I think that's a, that's a very enlightening idea. It's, it's, it puts me in mind of Dante making a journey into the inferno before he finds enlightenment paradiso at the end you know you've got to stick with that book it's a tough read but but would you would you say is it um are you do you know whether or not uh um Busoni was actually uh, uh an initiate was he well, affiliated with any particular orders that's what i i need to travel and find out i need to look in some archives in berlin um none of my researches have thrown up I've got a paper um, which outlines the analogy, uh, the, analog the uh, uh, analogous parts of, of the opera to certain very obvious connections to um, craft ritual. Um, it's pretty blatant, but then he did have a bit of a magpie mind. If you look at his library, so it's quite conceivable he could have read all the information and synthesized it. Um, but then he's, there are certain comments and certain encodings that I would argue that maybe um, like List before him and his, his good friend Sibelius was a Mason and they were, they were good buddies. They were, they were um, Sibelius would have said, um, if it hadn't been for Busoni, I wouldn't have made it past my third symphony. He'd reached a sort of a creative block and needed Busoni to arrange performances of his music, Sibelius' music, to really give him the confidence to carry on. It's not a well-known fact, and that's uh, when Erin Knitt was with us from Boston, that's her research has demonstrated um, a lot of key relationships that put composers on the map. Um, certainly would have been true of Arnold Schoenberg, the great radical of the early 20th century, if there was no Busoni, there would have been no Schoenberg. I would argue that very strongly um, because the first performances of some of Schoenberg's more radical music were held in Busoni's living room at his expense. <laughs> so, you know, it certainly overshadowed the uh, 20th century. And I don't think it's outside the bounds of possibility. I just haven't found the evidence, so I cannot proclaim it until there is a uh, a, a piece of paper like Franz Liszt's initiation certificate, which I have a copy of that. So that's that's real, you know. Um, you you mentioned that uh, the the opera was unfinished because he he passed, and uh, Benny is interesting. You mentioned the other uh, the uh, Russian composer whose piece entitled Initiation also was unfinished. Um, do you do you have any thoughts on uh, whether um, the, of the, the the merit or maybe lack of merit in uh, tr attempting to complete uh, a work that was unfinished in those ways? Got to declare a bit of an interest here. Um, I have been thinking of a way of completing. Uh, Dr. Faust. Um, Larry Sitsky's completion is 
absolutely my opinion it's never been performed it needs to be performed uh, i think it's incredibly close to busoni's sketches um i i speak to larry and i want to discuss with him a, a kind of an al alternative plan um, which i think is at least worth thinking about before it gets chucked in the bin um I think the other argument is the the Elijah Elisha argument, which is um, give me a double portion of your spirit. Uh, well, I can't do that, but if you can see me when I'm going, you can have my cloak. You know, and um, it was kind of I, I've reached this enlightenment and I'm off. I can't give you what you want, but you you're going to have to carry on the work in your own way. Maybe there's an element that these. Um, Scriabin, Busoni were analogous to Magi who left before their work was complete in order that the work could be continued. There's a messianic twist to that, possibly. Um, can't read too much into that, but it's just mm. human life. They died before they finished their work. Mm. Um, but does that mean their work is necessarily incomplete or just is carrying on in another form in terms of legacy? I find what you've just said extremely interesting um, because going back to the point of uh, uh, the statement about seeds having been sown, which late, uh, later generations will pick up on, it, I feel that it's it's people like yourself and probably your, your friends and colleagues um, who have a, such a deep connection to, to those themes and that work that it, it I find it very uh, insp inspiring to hear that you have ideas creatively about um, uh, continuing that work and uh, and creating uh, something which could uh, accompany that unfinished work uh, and and complement it. I, I composed um, a piece a few years ago where. I'm currently working on preparing an edition of Busoni's earlier opera, Die Brautwahl, for a German publisher. I'm going to write the preface to an edition they, they're putting out. And when I did a, I did a two piano piece, which was a kind of a sketch for a completion idea. And um, that exists. It's, it's on YouTube. Um, what I was going to put, what I was going to link to actually was put a, put a recording of that um, controversial piano work. If I can somehow get this, it's an MP3. If I can put it in the chat, then I'm not offending anyone's copyright here because I own it. Access to the file restricted by your account administrator. That's me. <laughs> so go. I want to donate it to my friends. Um, for some reason, that's not letting me put it in there. Although I am the account administrator, what on earth is going on? All right, I'll have to just, um, I'll, I'll have to put this on an email and you can feel absolutely free to distribute as you wish. I was reminded when you were talking about the point when do composers die, um, that. Puccini died before completing Turandot whilst he was being treated for cancer in Brussels. But his doctors, when asked why did he die, simply said, because his heart could take no more, which was an anatomical um, comment by doctors, but also I think a profound statement of there is a moment that one's emotions terminate one's existence. That's just it. You, 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 you're done. You, there's nothing else you can say. Yeah. I'm trying to find, I can, okay, I found, maybe I can get this into the chat. Ah, good. Okay. This, this is that piece of music I was alluding to that, um, if it will even go. Something's gone through, but I don't know what it is. 
yeah it's uh, not registering uh here for me i can see you've tried to send something but it's as yet it's blank yeah what i'll do is i'll try and do it a bit more um uh in another way sorry about this gents we will get it there okay this this contained a little bit of um sort of sketch i'm using themes from dr faust andy Broutval as a tribute this, this was a tribute piece to busoni um it's using a lot of his material in sort of a recombination it might be interesting please don't feel in any sense obliged um to waste your time on it um Somatina seconda would have been uh, more interesting to listen to but i can't uh, for some reason i can't get that across to you which is annoying even though it's my thing how irritating okay well, fred so if you want to if you, you want to email it to yeah. either me or she, then we can add it to the um, recording if you if you have a sort of short um, couple of sentences of explanation. Sure, I'm, I'm more than more than happy to do that. More than happy. It's actually uh, the book that Erin Knitt and I contributed a chapter to has recordings of um, early Bassoni music and the Sonatina uh, attached to the book. It's it's a Routledge uh, publication. Um, but I'll, I'll send it to you. It's out there. It's, just not, it's like I said, it's, it's um, as far as I'm concerned, it's in the public domain. So I can send it across. It's my recording. Well, thank you so much for all your comments. Incredibly valuable. And you must come to the symposium. <laughs> well, if, if you, if you, I'm sure if, if you send us details, then we can send that out to everybody to 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 by way of encouraging them to come wonderful yeah, thank you very much indeed fred uh, it's been a wonderful presentation really thought provoking um and i look forward to hearing more uh, from you in the future about what you get up to um uh, with you with your friend and your colleagues and uh, i wish you all the very best in your continuing uh, researches and work Thank you so much uh, for the amount of time you've you've let me uh, be with you all, and um, what an enlightening uh, group um, to be a part of. Really fantastic. Thank you so very much. Wonderful. Thank you, Fred. I wish you a wonderful weekend. Uh, likewise, everybody. Thanks so much for joining. Uh, yeah, lots of love to everyone. Have a wonderful rest of your weekend, and uh, we look forward to seeing you again next month. <laughs>